What do you say, everybody? Howdy. Let's talk uh, college football. It's time for Monday Night Quarterback with Kyle Henderson, Tony Sukalis, and Trey Yannity. I'm Mick Gillespie, where we talk every Monday night about the week that was in college football and uh, really the weekend that was in college football and also uh, what's going on this week. Guys, uh, first off, what a win for Alabama in the Iron Bowl. Uh, I guess it's just kind of this Alabama mentality, but we've talked, I mean, at least – to ourselves anyway, more about that fumble by Robinson than the domination by Alabama because the, I felt like you know Alabama was really that one play away from just absolutely creaming the Auburn Tigers. Kyle? Yeah, I think, I mean, it was a great win. I, as we talked about, you know, several times, um, you know, yesterday and as we listened to your show yesterday, I think overall when you grade this game out, I, I think it was a high, you know, if you're grading it on a 100-point scale, it, it was a 90, you know, 2% for me. I think it was uh, all phases of the game Alabama came with it from uh, the play of the offense, which was tremendous, Mac Jones time, um, the Iron Bowl record for touchdowns, uh, throwing in a single game to Devontae Smith, his outstanding performance, Najee Harris doing his thing. And then on the defensive side, um, really only allow, allowing Auburn for most of the game, controlling the entire momentum of that um, of Gus Malzahn's offense and only allowing 13 points. I think overall um, it was a great performance. And then special teams shine once again. And I said that would all be critical in uh, Alabama now eight and zero on the season with a tremendous win over the Auburn Tigers now turning the page to LSU. Yep. Yep. No doubt about it. Uh, what was it like on campus? And I know you weren't on campus, right? You were away for the holidays, Trey. But what's the student reaction for this one? Yeah, I mean, you know, in a rivalry game like this, it's always um, it's always heated. It's always personal. And, um, you know, that makes the win just that much more enjoyable in dominant fashion as well. You don't see that often in this rivalry. It's usually pretty tight, you know, one way or another, depending, um, you know, regardless of where they're ranked. But this year it was absolute dominance. Um, you know, campus was buzzing this weekend, a little bit different. Just because of Thanksgiving weekend, everything else, the students um, will not be returning after Thanksgiving break this year. So campus was a little bit different. Obviously, the stadium wasn't you know anywhere near capacity. Tailgating was all kinds of messed up. So the feel this year for the Iron Bowl, um, you know, was just so much different. I wasn't on campus for the game. Tony was. He can fill you in, you know, on exactly what it was like there. But um, you know, such a great win, and and I think it's going to be received well for quite some time. Yeah, Tony, you were there. Tony Sukalis is the Bama insider beat writer. You were there. You you were uh, one of the few people that actually got to be, and you know, in the stadium in person. There were a lot of upset folks, Alabama fans that wanted to be in the stadium. You were covering the game. No Nick Saban though. He was one of the people like us that wasn't there. What was uh, the reaction and the feeling around the team after that big win? Yeah, the odd the odd week that I'm in Bryant Denny Stadium and Nick Saban isn't. I don't think you know <laughs> that that will not happen again, probably ever. So, um, or I guess as long as he's the head coach of Alabama. But no, it was a the players certainly missed Nick Saban, of course. But um, you know, once the whistle start, once the first whistle started, it didn't. I mean, I, I don't want to say this as a slight to Nick Saban, but you didn't really notice his absence that much. I mean, things ran pretty smoothly. I think that's a credit to what Steve Sarkeesian did and, 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 and Pete Golding too on the defensive side of the ball. But look, Alabama looked like itself. There wasn't a time when you were like, man, if Saban was there, things would have been different. I, I kind of thought that it was just your average, you know, Alabama win from what we've seen this season. And, and that's the biggest compliment you can give to this coaching staff is that, you know, Saban had it so instilled everything there that, you know, his presence just kind of loomed over the game, even though he wasn't there. I think that's, it's also credit to him that he's able to do that and get his coaches ready for that. So um, it was weird not having him. It was weird zooming with him from his, uh, from his man cave in his, in his house, but he, he seemed pretty chill after the game. I'm sure there were some tense moments, uh, but uh, you know, overall, I think it was as normal as you could expect it. Great to have all of you with us tonight here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. If you're just tuning in, we got started a little bit early uh, for Monday Night Quarterback because we are rare in the talk. Alabama football, we're going to get into the LSU game later on, but right now we're recapping everything that happened in the world of Alabama football and that Iron Bowl and that big win this Saturday. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and you guys have really killed it. I mean, like every time I click back on, there's more of you that are part of the Bama Insider family, and we appreciate it. Also, with the holidays coming, now is the time 
to become a subscriber to BamaInsider.com. And the reason why, signing day's coming. A lot of news. Andrew Bones is going to be breaking here this week on you know some what's going on with this year's class, which is number one in the rival site. Uh, you'll find out all that stuff, and, and it's a great time to do it. $75, you get a year subscription, and you get a $75 gift card to Nike. So you get that Nike store gift card, and it basically pays for itself. Maybe you gift the subscription if you already have one. Maybe you keep the subscription, and you gift the Nike card. Maybe you keep them both. Maybe you give them both away. That's totally up to you. But right now, the holiday special is here. We are in holiday time. The promo code is Nike75. All right, guys, look, there was a time after the Ole Miss game, really before that, that Pete Golding was uh, about to be driven out of Tuscaloosa. I mean, they, they were starting to mount up a posse to gather him up and get his stuff and send him on his way. All of a sudden now, this defense – and you got to give Pete Golding some credit. They have been amazing since the second half of the Georgia game when when not only did they pop Georgia in the mouth, they really ended the Bulldogs' confidence this season. Uh, they gave up 17 points to Tennessee, as you see on the graphic. They shut out Mississippi State. They gave up three to Kentucky. They should have only given up six to, to Auburn. There was a very late trash time touchdown, but they have been playing, Tony, excellent football. Tell me why Pete Golding uh, has turned this thing around, or has it been somebody else? I think it's been Pete Golding. I think it's just a matter of him getting you know through to these players. I think it's also a lot of this, these players uh, growing. Look, you look at the secondary, and it had some young players. Look at the growth of this secondary. You're, you're seeing guys like Brian Branch, Malachi Moore. I'm they're stepping in, and they're making huge plays. Uh, those are young dudes that, you know, earlier in the season were, were making mistakes. Uh, Jordan Battle, another guy, uh, he had some up and down performances. He's been stable. And then you've got the two guys on the outside and Patrick Sertan and Josh Job, and they're so steady. We don't talk about them a lot uh, just because they don't give us reason to talk about. It. And I think as a cornerback, that's like the biggest praise is if you can kind of go unnoticed, it means that you know nobody's really making a play on your side. And I think that, that you could say that about both Patrick Sertan and Josh Job. And then, you know, like you've seen it. I think we've seen Dylan Moses get a, a little bit better. He's not really been his old self yet. We haven't seen him, you know, step into that dominant role, but you're seeing a guy like Christian Harris is totally taking off. And I think you got to credit, um, Pete Golding for that as well. And, you know, up front, I mean, you're starting to see guys like, um, I know that the sacks haven't been there, even though the pressures kind of have, but last game they had three sacks. And I, I think you saw a lot of uh, uh, Chris Smith. I mean, sorry, Chris Allen. My bad. Chris, Christopher Allen. And I think his ability to kind of get to the, the, the quarterback, I, you know, you've got these, you've got the makings of a really capable defense and credit to Pete Golding for putting it all together. Well, Kyle, I'm going to pose a similar question to you, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I think the reason is is that they are getting more pressure on the quarterback. Uh, Anderson and uh, Barrymore and Allens and Lewis and Moses at times, I feel like that's the difference right now for Alabama because it makes everyone better. I mean, Malachi Moore is going to be able to get in front of a ball. Daniel Wright's going to be able to get a, in front of a pass and, and turn it into a turnover, in my opinion. Tell me why. I'm right or I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, look at this guy's face right here from Auburn. I mean, he's completely shocked that Christian Barmore is about to bury Bo Nix. I mean, look at his eyes. I mean, I think that says uh, it says a lot right there. An image paints a thousand words. Um, even this guy right here to the right, he's like, my goodness, look at Christian Barmore. I think when you look at the Alabama defense, I mean, you're you're right. I think you know it, it's time that the Alabama. Uh, pass rush has really got things going. Um, as Tony said, Chris Allen uh, got another quarterback sack. He's been playing very well. You continue to say high praise and, um, you know, a high um, motor from William Anderson, the freshman. And Christian Barmore is a guy that we talk a lot about. Fedarian Mathis, another guy at the defensive line that continues to make plays. So all across the board, this defense is playing at a very high level. I think it's the right time. As you, if you look um, from week one to week eight, this defense is really doing a great job. And I talked about this on my Sunday observations. It's, it's the little things. It's just simple tackling. It's wrapping up, putting the face mask right in the chest, doing those little things. And of course, it helps when you have um, guys that are played inspired. And I think the defense did play inspired being that Nick Saban was out. I think everybody played inspired with Nick Saban being out. Like, let, let's win this for Nick Saban, so to speak. Um, loved the pass rush. And um, and I want to hit on another point that Tony was talking about. You look at the Alabama's defense, extremely young. Uh, Jordan Battle, sophomore. DeMarco Hellum, sophomore. Um, 
You could go uh, William Anderson. He's a freshman. You can talk about uh, Malachi Moore, a freshman. Brian Branch, a freshman. So a lot of – DeMarco Hellams, a freshman. So a lot of these guys, um, either sophomores or freshmen, Chris, Christian Harris, there's another one. So when you look down the road, uh, Alabama's defense in a very good uh, position, very young, but playing at a very high level. Yeah, no doubt, man. Um, I thought Daniel Wright made some really good plays in the game. You know, there was a, a, a screen pass – that he blew up and he didn't have anything to do with the tackle. Uh, he just turned to play inside and then all of a sudden they gang tackled the receiver for Auburn. And it really just kind of showed how this team is starting to grow up. You know, like I early in the season, he's trying to step in front of a pass at Ole Miss and misses the guy and, and instead of just making the play and then it turns into a touchdown, you know. Um, they're becoming more experienced and uh, a lot more comfortable out there. And, uh, you know, it was a, a very good win for Alabama, but you know, no one's talking about getting rid of, of Pete Golding anymore. Uh, the other thing, Trey, when you look at this, it's a, it's a win over Alabama. Uh, the Tide's 2-2 two and two against Auburn in the last four games, but the two in Tuscaloosa have just been complete drummings. I wonder if, if uh, Gus Malzahn is uh, – I mean, he's on the perpetual hot seat, but I wonder if it's gotten hotter after another beatdown in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing about Gus Malzahn is um, through all of his successes and failures, he's been able to win this game, you know, in his in his career, you know, better than everybody else. Not at a super high level. He was three and four coming into this game on Saturday, but he knows how to beat Alabama. So not being able to do that obviously makes his seat a little bit hotter. But, um, you know, I think Auburn knew what they had in this game. They, they knew that Alabama was just a much, much better team on both sides. I think people are still coming around to the defense. We've been talking about it here for the last few minutes. People still aren't sold, um, you know, regardless of the fact that for 10 quarters, Alabama only let up six points going into the second half on Saturday. People still don't, I think, fully believe. And I think some of that is maybe still a little bit of immaturity on defense um, for, from certain guys. And it's funny because, you know, I say immaturity. Malachi Moore, some of the younger kids are actually the ones really stepping up and and making plays. But I think I think that all comes back to just becoming more fundamental and, and keeping consistent and doing that. They've been in better position these last few weeks, if you guys have noticed. You know, certain guys have been just in the right spots to make plays. And like Kyle said, they're making the tackles. They're wrapping up. They're doing the little things right now. And that's that's so key. And I think that is credit to Pete Golding and what he's done. Um, but, you know, overall, if this defense is able to play like that on a consistent basis, there's not any team in the country that can beat Alabama. Auburn this year has just been so inconsistent. I think Gus Malzahn, um, you know, knew that this was an opportunity to get a big win, knew that he wasn't going to have to see Nick Saban on the other sideline. Um, but I, I don't know if this changes anything just because of how dominant Alabama is and, um, you know, rivalry or not, how dominant they were going to be in that game. Yeah, well, it's a rivalry game and, you know, people can say what they want. Uh, anytime Alabama and Auburn get together, it's, you know, it means a lot in the state of Alabama. And if you haven't been the one yet, you really should check it out because the intensity there is incredible. All right, let's take a look at some other games that have significance to Alabama. One of them is number five, Texas A&M. They're the thing that's holding Alabama from uh, officially being able to, uh, uh, to punch the ticket to the uh, SEC championship game. They're six and one. They beat LSU. Saturday night, 20 to seven. It wasn't impressive really at all, except Isaiah Spiller, their running back, uh, 27 carries 141 yards. But Kellen Mond failed to go over 100 yards. LSU, and I don't want you guys to talk about Alabama and LSU. I want you to talk about Alabama and Texas A&M right now. We're going to swing back to that later. Um, but LSU's offense had a tough time moving the football. They had two different quarterbacks. Uh, Terrence Marshall, their top receiver, opted out before the Alabama game. Uh, I feel like they're the Titanic right now, except that they're probably more than halfway underwater after hitting the iceberg. And and Terrence Marshall jumping off sends a message to this team. I don't want to be there when the, the beatdown happens. Keep that in mind when we get into that later on. But I want you just to talk about Texas A&M and the struggles, or did you think maybe it was just a defensive struggle uh, in the ballgame? Did their offense struggle, or was it just the fact that LSU played excellent defense, only keeping them to 20 points? It was a tough game for me to watch anyway, Kyle. 
I mean, Texas a and I, I think that, you know, they're, they're an interesting team to talk about because I, I when we watched them against Alabama, I wasn't overly impressed. I mean, we've seen Kellen Munn again and again, um, does a good job and, um, but but he was he was just okay. I think Alabama really took it to them, and I, I never really saw it even really being much of a game, to be honest. Um, the score against LSU was really surprising, just because it seems like Texas A&M is in a good position right now, ranked number five in the college football playoff rankings. But then LSU, with everything that's going on, they're still able to keep it close with Texas A&M. Uh, I, I don't know really how much to take away from that game. I think if Alabama and Texas A&M um, were to some how meet again in some weird Frankenstein set up playoff matchup that Alabama would just beat Texas A&M by three or four touchdowns. Again, uh, Kellen Munn continues to be um, an average serviceable quarterback, Jimbo Fisher. I mean, he he's making all that cash, but what has he really done? Who has he really beaten? Um, and it, they're not really an impressive team to me. Yeah. And Tony, you know, not only that, they're kind of hanging around and if they continue to win, which, uh, my my buddy Max Howe, for those of you that haven't caught him yet, former coach and longtime uh, SEC broadcaster talking football, we do the Max and Mick podcast every Sunday night. So you can download it um, wherever you get your podcast. Just uh, go to the Bama Insider site on there, the page, and then uh, the Max and Mick podcast. There. But anyway, Max thinks that they're going to lose to Auburn this week. He was absolutely unimpressed by them. If they beat Auburn – uh, and they somehow get through the season with just the loss to Alabama, Tony. The fact that Ohio State's having so much trouble right now where they might not have enough games to to qualify for their conference tournament or the college football playoff tournament, as ugly as Texas A&M's wins are, they're still in this ballgame. Yeah, it, it kind of creates a situation of where you got to consider, you know, at what point, do you look at the maybe the talent of the team? Because I think you you can look at the talent of uh, Ohio State and then the talent of Texas A&M, and, and it, you know, we were going to yeah. project who was going to win between those two teams. Obviously, I think most people would say Ohio State. Uh, but then at one point, you know, even though that one loss, I mean, if, if A&M goes 9-1 and, and and let's say Ohio State goes 5-0, and 6-0, which is better, you know? I mean, at what point do you start giving Texas A&M credit for playing those extra games and winning those extra games? Uh, it'll be an interesting decision to make. Um, that being said, I don't see Texas A&M as a playoff contender unless they can get more stability out of the quarterback position. Look, Kellen Mon, he has the ability to be a capable quarterback, but if you cannot perform against that LSU secondary that's been, like, historically bad um, – I, I just – he's not going to be able to do it against a, a playoff team. If he, if he plays like that against Auburn, they will lose against Auburn. So th there might need to be a change uh, behind center for the Aggies if they're really going to make a playoff run. I just don't see Kellen Mund at the moment, you know, from what we've seen of him, his inconsistency. I, I don't see him as being the guy that leads the Aggies to the playoffs. And so, you know, I think I'm still picking a and in, in that game, but I wouldn't be surprised if Auburn turned around and won, especially um, – especially if mom plays like that. I, mean, I could see an inspired Auburn bunch looking to kind of rebound from an Alabama loss. And I, I, I could see that upset coming. Trey's here. I mean, he's a smart guy. He's in college right now. He, he'll help us do the math, Tony. You got Alabama and Florida playing, right? So someone's going to lose that game. You got Clemson and uh, Notre Dame playing. Someone's going to lose that. You got, Ohio State, who right now is in a lot of trouble because they've just if if they close down and cancel one more game and they've got Michigan and Michigan State on the schedule, they're not going to have enough wins to qualify unless something changes. So Trey, I mean, I, you could make the case for Texas A and M, and another team you could make the case for is Cincinnati. I think in, in 2020, you could make a case for eight or nine different teams for for different reasons. This is such a weird year, and it's created so many different weird situations. But at the end of the day, if the committee wanted to, I think they could sit there and say, look, we got to let in Clemson. You know, if they assuming they beat Notre Dame the second time around, we got to let in Alabama, obviously. Probably, you know, Notre Dame still. And I, I hate to say this. I think they still take Ohio State um, any way you draw it. I think they're going to look at it and say this team is, is far and away the best team on paper. They haven't had too many chances to prove it. They haven't lost. They have a top 10 win. Um, if they can't play in their conference title game, 
you know, that that's going to be that's going to be a really hard decision. I think it, it's going to come down to, you know, how they finish out this season, if that's the case. But I, I think one way or another, Ohio State's in this playoff. They're just too good. I, I don't think you can look at Texas A&M like Tony was saying. Just think about the matchup. If those two schools. were well, Hold on. Let me ask you this. You said yeah. one way or the other. If they only played four or five games. What's their record right now? Four and zero. Four and zero. Yep. Okay, they're four and zero, and the and the conference says they had to have six. They have to have six games, right? And and they've got Michigan shut down right now. If someone was telling me today, okay, so if they don't play but five games, it, how are they going to get in there? I mean, how's the? Tell me the other. You said one way or the other. I want. I'm just curious. I think the other is just the committee sitting down and saying. This team is just that good. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be a case of, you know, has AM improved it enough or if these other teams proved it enough? I, it, Ohio State won't have the chance to really prove it all the way. But I think if they play five, they play six games, the committee's going to say, you know, this is just a really weird year. This is, this is a different situation. You know, this is unlike any situation we've ever dealt with and any situation we're going to have to deal with. So let's just put an asterisk next to this one, make it a different kind of decision in a different kind of year. Let Ohio State in. Take the four best teams at the end of the day. I think that's what it's about for this playoff. I really wish, to be honest, they would have expanded it to eight. We've heard that that talk a lot. Just since it's a weird year, you know, the baseball playoffs, everything else were expanded. Football, you know, having eight would be would be great this year. They take away a lot of controversy, uh, but that's not the case. I think the top four is gonna gonna look how it is right now at the end of the season. Love that. Yeah, comment. but that would add an extra game, Sorry. and so that'd be really hard. What the eight? Yeah, the eight, yeah. that's just adding yeah. more to the mix. You no, know, it, it does complicate things, yeah. but it'd be fun. It'd be, a, it'd be a cool twist on it. Well, I mean, but if you were Ohio State and you had five games, I mean, you could add an extra game before. Maybe it wouldn't be a playoff, but I, I love this suggestion here from Sean Stapleton. He's like, hey, what if they just added that? I think Cincinnati and BYU should play. I mean, this is the year where you could pop an extra game in. I saw a team just yeah. did that recently, too. Maybe UAB got an extra game in there and and because they had a bunch of cancellations. Um, it's a weird year in that aspect, and I'm not saying that, Trey, you're not totally wrong, that Ohio State could find a way in. I just think it's going to be tough because of the restrictions that they have kind of, you know, in that conference and and everything else to, to be able to slip in if they don't play the next two games. Uh, the other team and before I really get into this, uh, I want to remind all of you guys, hit the thumbs up, subscribe as you watch us on YouTube, on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Kyle, Tony, Trey, and me, Mick Gillespie, appreciate all you guys being here. Uh, we're talking to Alabama. We're going to get into Alabama LSU later, but we're, we're kind of recapping the games from last week that have a significant uh, play on Alabama and staying in the SEC the final game I want to look at is Florida beat Tech, uh, Kentucky uh, 34 to 10. It was a much different game, guys, than the one that I saw in Tuscaloosa where Alabama just lambasted at Kentucky. And I didn't think Kentucky was that bad of a team, but Alabama wore them out. Kyle Trask did some things. He didn't help his, his uh, Heisman candidacy. He didn't hurt his Heisman candidacy. I thought Mac Jones maybe separated himself from Trevor Lawrence. But we're on this collision course again, Florida and Alabama and Atlanta. It's not official yet, but it will be, I think, after next week, we'll know that it's going to be those two teams on December 19th, Kyle. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I didn't want to overjump anybody. I was kind of waiting patiently to talk about. I just wanted to put one more endpoint on the on the Big Ten before we get to Florida. Um, I, I just want to say this is all the Big Ten's fault. I mean, they never had to postpone the season early like they did in the beginning of the year. I mean, I, I know, and I've said this before, a lot of people don't like Greg Sankey, but what he did was he allowed weeks to to for these postponements, and now you're seeing teams that are able to reschedule. Credit to him. The Big Ten didn't do that, and now you're looking at a Big Ten team like Ohio State. If you can't finish your season, I'm sorry. I mean, it's up to your commissioner. So you got to play your football, and now you don't have enough games to qualify for the Big the you know for the college football playoff so you go play someone else and and we'll see you some other time um getting to florida and kentucky Great point, by the way really good point yeah, i agree I, with you. I mean that that really comes i mean we saw this coming a mile away you know um i, I think when you look at florida and kentucky i mean kentucky i mean the, they're a time of possession team they're they're trying to play inspired for their coach who passed away there there was no way that they were going to beat florida and in any means and like you said kyle trask didn't help he didn't hurt his heisman odds um when you look at the overall statistics that kyle has put up they're pretty fantastic uh throwing three more touchdowns no interceptions against kentucky there was a time where i turned the tv on and kentucky 
Kentucky was up 10 to 7. Didn't really surprise me. I mean, those games are kind of strange when you play a team with lesser competition. Um, I didn't watch the entire game, but I knew that, that Florida would uh, end out on top. I know that Florida and Alabama are on a collision course, which I love because it sets up Mac Jones versus Kyle Trask, two guys that are very well deserving of the award we're about to talk about later on in the show. Uh, Florida is a good team. Um, Kyle Pitts should be healthy by then, which I think will be great. I love uh, everything that he brings to the table. I'm curious to see how Alabama would match up with him. I think he's one of the top players in all of college football, a guy that I would really love on my team. Uh, so Kyle Pitts, uh, definitely a uh, big time. And Florida has some weapons, and uh, we'll see how they can do. I, I feel they're a one-dimensional team. I don't feel that they can run the football. And uh, we'll have to see how good their defense is when they do match up with Alabama's offense. Right on. Uh, Tony, uh, the, the Heisman talk is, is really starting to focus in on this SEC championship game that we're expecting between Mac Jones, Alabama, Kyle Trask, and Florida. Your thoughts on this Heisman race right now, and we'll throw up the graphic where Kyle Trask right now is the odds-on favorite to win it. Yeah, so I think if the Heisman was tomorrow, then I think it definitely goes to Kyle Trask. but it's not tomorrow and there probably is going to be an Alabama Florida matchup. And I think that's also going to be what decides this, uh, this Heisman race. Um, look, as long as Mac Jones keeps things close, as long as, as he's able to, he's not going to catch up to the touchdowns. Kyle Trask has way more touchdowns than anybody. You know, he's going to probably have 40 at the end of the season. Mac Jones is going to be more like around 30. Okay. But if Mac Jones can stay close on all the other stats, which Mac Jones leads Kyle Trask in a bunch of stats, if he can just hover there and he beats Florida, I can't see the Heisman voters giving the the Heisman to a guy that just lost to his main competition in a head-to-head -head battle. It just doesn't seem right. doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I mean, there's certain circumstances, and maybe Alabama beats Florida and Mac Jones doesn't have a great game and Kyle Trask does have a great game but loses. I mean, sure, that, that could happen. But I think if it's anywhere close and Mac Jones is able to best Kyle Trask in a one-on-one -on -one setting – I just don't see how he doesn't get it then. Um, so I think it really does boil down to this SEC championship game. Um, uh, and then really, honestly, when you look at the at the stats between the two quarterbacks, other than touchdowns, they're right there within, you know, touching distance of, of each other. And Mac Jones actually, I think, leads in, in, in a bunch of those. A completion percentage is one of them. Uh, Passer efficiency is another one. Uh, so it, they're, it's really close. I think Trevor Lawrence hasn't played enough, uh, and that's going to really hurt him. Same with Justin Fields. And then, you know, I know there's been some talk. I mentioned Devontae Smith in, in my uh, Heisman watch feature, but I don't see it not going to a quarterback. But, you know, shout out to Devontae Smith for having a hell of a season. I think the Blitnikoff Award is his. Um, but yeah, that's a topic for well, another time. <laughs> right. And, and let me just kind of take over right here. Um, Trey, I'm watching the game and I'm watching Mac Jones and then I'm watching Devontae Smith make Mac Jones look a lot better than the performance really was. You know, he throws like a five yard pass and and Smitty just runs by everybody and scores a touchdown. And it goes in the book as a 65 yard touchdown or 55 yards. And and Smitty and the receivers that were blocking and the play execution were just as important as the throw, which Mac did a really good job of disguising the uh the you know the pass uh and i'm thinking of that one particular screen pass you know it was amazing um you know or where, where they faked the, they faked the screen and then threw it to uh Devontae smith and he outran everybody so if, if mac jones win wins this award i mean Devontae smith deserves part of it almost to me I, maybe more than part of it. maybe they just split the thing down the middle <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Devontae Smith, this is not a wide receiver's reward. It never will be, it never has been. But, you know, if there is ever a wide receiver in a year, Devontae Smith has done so much for Mac's case. And, it, you know, this is usually the, the case. There's two or three guys that really help get a quarterback there, um, you know, in the Heisman conversation. But they've been helping each other out all season long. And I think Devontae Smith's route running ability in the past game is really what helped him flex the muscle early on, especially on that route just burning it, you know, the inside, cutting back and, um, you know, creating all kinds of space. But this offense, you know, Devontae Smith, they both can hurt you in so many different ways. That's what makes it so dynamic, what makes his game so dynamic. The, just, you know, the speed, the the hands that he has, the, you know, the route running, like I said. There's so many different ways that this guy can, you know, just 
completely tear up a defense. And same with Mac Jones this season. Um, as far as Najee Harris goes, you really couldn't have a better year. It's it's, it's really sad for all these guys because I think in a 12 game season, in a regular season, you know, we're looking back at some of these numbers and it's just, you know, record after record, but they're not going to be able to play that many games. And, um, you know, maybe against non conference opponents, things would be a little bit different. But as a whole, there's no stopping this Alabama offense right now. They're going to hurt you in so many different ways. You'll love to see it. Hopefully, after that SEC title game, um, you know, you have a Heisman front runner in Mac Jones as well. But like Tony said, I, I think it's going to come all down to that game in Atlanta. Kyle, why is no one putting Najee Harris at the top of this list? You compare him to what Mark Ingram did in 09. You compare him to, to what um, Derrick Henry did in, in his last year at Alabama. His numbers in some areas uh, are better, and yet it's all about Mac Jones right now. Yeah, I'm trying to find a graphic right now that I recently created uh, talking about Najee Harris. Actually, here it is. Um, I mean, you look at these overall numbers and it's pretty incredible. And I can have uh, Tony kind of talk about some of these uh, career yardage numbers where he is statistically. But I mean, you look right here, 3,200 career uh, yards, 37 touchdowns. And I think he's pretty close to to breaking um, Derrick Henry's overall uh, career rushing record, uh, along with uh, Mark Ingram and Derrick Henry's uh, touchdown mark. I mean, those are just extraordinary numbers. Um, combined with what he's done this year. And, and this is a guy who uh, a lot of people felt that, you know, he could lead to the NFL draft after his junior season, but he came back, he's worked hard. And one of the biggest things that I want everybody to, to realize about Najee Harris and, and not to overstate is his durability. This guy has really came in, he stayed healthy. Uh, and, you know, he's continued to show that he's a every, every down back, which we knew he was going to be. And he's a guy built for Sundays, right? Six foot two, 235 pounds. Uh, Tony, let me pass the ball to you real quick. Um, he's pretty close to breaking those uh, career marks set by Derrick Henry and Mark Ingram, right? Yeah, he's 321 rushing yards away from, you know, reaching Derrick Henry's mark and then five touchdowns away from reaching Derrick Henry and uh, Mark Ingram. They're, they're both tied at, at 42. So those are both reachable numbers considering that he's probably, you know, look, if Alabama plays the next two games plus the SEC, that's guaranteed three, plus they'll either play in a bowl game or the playoffs, so that's four. So 300 yards in, in, in four games, of, you know, five touchdowns in four games, I think those are both reachable. And then if they make the national championship, which I think a lot of people expect them to do, that'd be a fifth game. Uh, so that's, you know, a touchdown and 100 yards in each game, he'd, he'd easily make it. So um it, they're, they're both really in reach. It's crazy. You never know with, with COVID what's going to happen. You know, it's like hard to project these things. A while ago, we thought Alabama would only be playing nine games in the regular season. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But he's definitely within reaching distance of, of, of both of those records. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, kind of how you and, – and, and maybe you could put that graph back up again, the, the uh, Vegas odds on the Heisman Trophy right now. But it's amazing how many – contributors are on this Alabama team when you talk about Harris and Smitty and uh, and Mac Jones that that make this team roll and and that's on offense why they've been so just really amazing but you know Mac Jones being the leader of the pack uh, on the other hand you got to feel for Trevor Lawrence because you know he's done nothing but just perform every time he's gotten the opportunity but he's run into the same problem that Ohio State has and that's he got COVID and missed two games, and then they had the game against Florida State canceled. And so he just doesn't have the body of work right now, even though he does have really good numbers to overcome this two-horse SEC race. I mean, wouldn't you say that, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, but but the thing about Trevor Lawrence, and I think we all have to to you know kind of just wait and see how his season ends because he's going to get opportunities. He just played his first um, game within five weeks because he had COVID, and then there was you know a couple games postponed. But I mean, you look at his overall statistics; they're very impressive: twenty two hundred yards, nineteen touchdowns, two interceptions. He's going to have um, the entire spotlight on him when Clemson and Notre Dame do play, and I think if that's a game that Clemson wins, he's going to be right back up there. Remember, this was the post. Yeah. boy of college football for the last several years and i think everyone's just waiting for him to have that big moment and if he's able to beat notre dame which i think they're going to do i think a lot of people feel that uh, that clemson is going to beat notre dame then he is going to get an opportunity to either go against let's say a justin fields uh, a mac jones in the playoffs or in the title game and he's going to have his opportunity so he might not win uh the heisman trophy but clemson i think is the only team 
that I think could challenge Alabama. So let's say, um, you know, he, he's going to have his moment and he's very talented. He's the guy who's definitely coming off the board first in the NFL. So his numbers aren't terrible. These other guys have been kind of rolling and have the notoriety right now, but we're a long way from the Heisman Trophy presentation and we're a long way from the college football national championship. Did you guys, and I want to kind of switch gears here to LSU. Do you remember when, um, you know, the, the movie, the Gipper and it, and it was like, what was it? Newt, Newt Rockney is played by Ronald Reagan. And he gave that, that locker room speech where he got, he got the guys ready to win that football game. And then, you know, like when Jay Barker, my, my buddy, I used to do uh, broadcasting with would talk about Gene Stallings, just getting the guys fired up with a locker room speech, you know, Nick Saban, you know, I elect to kick ass. I mean, I'm just quoting him. You know, can you imagine what it would be like in the locker room when when he's talking to the guys and and motivating them? That's what great coaching is all about. You know, when when these guys when they they pick the perfect words to motivate the guys their team to play their best. I'm going to go ahead and show you one of those and then we're going to talk about it here in just a minute. Everybody, everybody, hey, we've been waiting for this moment, man. Let's go right here in the middle of that field. Let's bring it down, Tigers on three. Hell yeah! Because this is our house from now on. Yes, sir. Tigers on three. One, two, three. Tigers! <laughs> All right, maybe that wasn't quite the Newt Rockney speech, but uh, we're going into Alabama and LSU. Uh, I've just got to play that every time I can. I got to get the total plays out of that. Kyle, I'll just start with you and and and, and get your thoughts. But we got Alabama, we got LSU. Um, this this rivalry that's really almost been like you know Ed Orgeron wanting to beat Nick Saban. You know they lose, they get whooped. He goes into the pr- post game press conference. He says, "Hey, you know we're close." Da, 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 da. Then last year they beat Alabama, right? And, and, and there's just a whole lot, I feel like, quiet, bla- bad blood between these teams because of stuff like that that was done and said in this football game. Um, I, just, I just think Alabama is going to do what Alabama does, and they're going to be real quiet, and they're going to carry a big stick, and they're going to go in there and smack some Tigers around on Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, listening to Nick Saban speak, and I have Ed Orgeron's press conference. I can play some sound from that or from Nick Saban uh, should the mood strike. But I think listening (laughs) to Nick uh, Saban's press conference, I mean, he said this. He's like, look, I never use revenge as a motivating factor. And I thought that was really interesting because he said every single team is different. Every single season is different. But at the same time, he also said that, you know, when you do lose a game, you do feel disrespected. And I kept my eye and my ear rather on the word disrespected, because I think what he was saying that he knows. I mean, Nick Saban, he's not on social media. He's not on Twitter. But by no means is he completely far out. You know, he knows exactly what's happening. And he knows that Ed Orgeron had those faithful words to say in the locker room following the game. And, you know, he's not going to come out and publicly say that they're going for LSU. But between him and his team, they're going for LSU's throat. I mean, this is a rivalry game year in and year out, and it doesn't matter the season. Alabama is coming for LSU. We already talked about it. Tony put out a a great graphic today uh, regarding the last time that LSU even scored a touchdown in their home stadium. It's been a long time. So Alabama certainly come into Baton Rouge with, uh, with a strong message. And there's a lot of people that felt that this game didn't even need to take place because Alabama really has nothing to gain from it because, you know, where they are. And um, I get that. But the teams are playing. So I, I know there's a lot of fans out there that want to see Alabama just stomp the ground with LSU. And I think that's certainly going to happen. Tony, you know, I, I know that you saw that video and you were ready to run through the wall. No, probably it, I'm wondering, Tony, really, if. If uh, well, you know what? I'm gonna hold that question for Trey. I got a good one for you, Trey. Oh yeah, uh, 20, yeah. Just, just, just wait. After Tony's <laughs> finished, I'm coming back to you, Tony. What does this game mean to both of these programs? Um. Well, for this season, not to be a buzzkill, but for this season, uh, not not a lot. I think you know LSU's kind of packed it up, and uh, and and Alabama. This is just another uh, stepping stone on their way to the SEC title, but. Look for the players. I think it, it means a little bit because, like like we said, that that revenge factor. Alabama is not going to say anything, and, and really, you know, I, I would debate whether or not the players want to play this game. But since they have to play this game, I think they definitely want to, you know, make their presence felt. And so, I, I definitely think that there there's going to be a lot of those uh, 
I think there's going to be a lot of those reminders from last year, the, the, the clip that you show, there's another one that's a little bit uh, more, you know, rated R <laughs> and then there's a, uh, there's some other ones like uh, like the LSU players running up to the Alabama recruits. I, I think that those things are going to be brought up within the locker room. Look, we saw how Alabama reacted to, to Bo Nix calling uh, Mac Jones or inferring that Mac Jones was a was a game manager. Uh, <laughs> I think that this team does take things personally, and so now that they have to play this game, I think that uh, I, I think that it's it's going to mean something to them, and I think that they're going to kind of. I think you'll see it in the scoreboard if you know what I mean. <laughs> Hmm, I, I wonder. All right, Trey, here's the question I was going to ask Tony, but I, I, I made a mistake and I had to save this for you. You, you watch that video clip and, and Ed Orgeron's in there talking about, you know, this, we've been waiting a long time for this. And from now on, this is our house. And then you hear that guy in the background scream like, yeah, yeah. Um, if you were on that team and say maybe you were a sophomore or a freshman, is there a party that's going, uh oh. I know next year all these guys aren't going to be here and they're going to be mad over there. <laughs> you know, I, I probably would have reached out to Bo Burrow been like, hey, man, is there any way I can come with you to Cincinnati? <laughs> you know, you train or something? Um, it, it just was not a good idea on so many levels. So disrespectful. Um, it, it's a different brand, though. Yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, Alabama puts off a very mature, disciplined, um, respectable image every single time they go out. You know, even on days they're not playing, it's just that's the image of the brand at LSU. It's not been the same way. Um, You know, they're very prideful group. Uh, They're very spirited fan base, which is awesome. Um, But, you know, at times it gets disrespectful. It happened last year and I get it. You know, I get it. I think you got to take it as a sign of, of respect in a way, as funny as that sounds, because, you know, they're that excited to be getting a win over you in a regular season game. Um, and, and, you know, I think for the players, it was part of the ride, you know, for the seniors, it was probably, it was probably awesome. Cause they knew that this was it. This is going to be the last time they, they had to play Alabama. Probably they, uh, you know, thought that it could happen in the playoff again that year. It didn't. Um, and you know, it was just part of their national championship run. So I think in the moment it was probably the greatest thing ever, but looking back on it, I'm sure a lot of people, including Ed Orgeron, wish that they had not done that that day. I was on Dave Schultz's show in, Mo- in Mobile today, and I, I described LSU's season last year as that song Brandy by Looking Glass. Do, do you guys know that song? Do you even know that? So th- th- it's an old school song, and, it, and it's like oh, they're a one-hit wonder. And I think it's one of the best one-hit wonder songs ever. You know, Brandy, you're a fine girl. What a good wife you'd be. You know, it's about a guy that sails out. It's a great song. And I'm sure you guys have all heard it. It's like a golden oldie, right? But no, I've point, heard it, Mick. Oh, you know, I've heard it. I'm, it's a great yeah. song, right? But it's right. also the only song those guys had. And I feel like that's LSU season last year with Ed Orgeron. And now it's 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 time to, to, pay, to pay the bill. And it's not only the the fact that they're losing games at a pace right now, uh, which is amongst the worst in years, you know, maybe like 50 years. They're one of the worst defending national champs in 50 years. Um, Everyone's jumping off of the boat, you know, Uh, including Terrence Marshall. Who who just threw the life he threw the life raft in the water after the Texas A and M game he got the oars he put out a statement talking about Kyle he wants to be in the NFL and and Mel Kiper has him as you know the number twenty four player in the draft and the fourth receiver and he's in that raft right now and as the Titanic sinks he can't get away fast enough the guy had one hundred and thirty four yards receiving in the Texas A and M game. And before the biggest game of the season, there he goes. Yeah, the, timing's the, the timing's odd, right? Right. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, Terrence Marco, I mean, I, I, people were talking about him. I, I'm not really too concerned about him. I mean, like Nick Saban talked about him today. He's a great wide receiver. Um, you know, what type of impact would he have in this game? I guess we'll never know. Um, you know, the, the past you know, couple of years, he's been pretty productive. And, you know, we're going to see him on. Um, you know, in, in the NFL, when you kind of look to these, this was kind of like transfer or announcement Monday with a lot of these guys opting out 
there's a lot of programs that have pretty much just shut down. I think it's kind of the the time that we're in. Um, LSU, what, what do they really have to play for? Um, I mean, the, the thing about it is I did listen to Ed Orgeron's press conference, and this is getting to Terrence Marshall. He said Marshall came into his office, talked to him like a man, and said, look, this is what's best for me, best for me right now, and I'm going to opt out. So, I mean, that's kind of between them. I don't think it's going to have too big of an impact on uh, this weekend's game because I think the biggest uh, factor in this weekend's game is that Nick Saban is going to be back on the sidelines uh, coaching against bad uh, – coaching against Ed Orgeron and I, and I think as we've talked about, I mean, there's, there's a lot to play for, uh, for Alabama. I think just overall, because they have so much uh, going on for them right now. Yeah. I mean, and then you're right. Alabama is going to be a big favorite and that they've got to be a bigger favorite. Uh, Tony though, what does that tell you about what's going on in Baton Rouge? You got players opting out, a lot of players opting out and look, I get it. You go to college to get a job and make money. You don't make money. Um, as a college football player, but you get a lot of opportunities, right? So maybe you worry, you know, you get into this game, the next game you get hurt and, um, you know, and something happens to your draft stock, right? That's why you go to college. But this is an eight-game season and it's not like, you know, and it'll be 10 if you play all the games. It's still way fur- like way less than last year when LSU played 15 and won them all. Uh, but what, is, what does that tell us about what's going on there? And does that tie in with the story about the, uh, the allegations of, of sexual misconduct with former players being covered up and, and all that stuff, whether it's true or not? Uh, but just there's just a really bad look to me down in Baton Rouge right now, or I could be wrong. I mean, those are two separate things, uh, like, like completely polar opposite things. I mean, look, for Terrace Marshall, uh, I mean – is it unfortunate, you know, for, for his teammates that are still playing that he, you know, stopped playing, you know, sure. But I, I think you could almost make the argument that LSU as a whole stopped playing. I mean, look, th- th- this team's a shell of itself. It's three and four. It's not going to have a good season. It wasn't going to beat Alabama with him. It's not going to beat Alabama without him. Uh, and, and I think that, you, you know, when you look at him, he's a possible first rounder. I don't necessarily hate the decision for him. I think it's kind of – it looks very soft since it was right before you played the number one team in the nation. You don't play. I mean, if you're looking to highlight yourself, uh, why didn't you, you know, opt out before the AM game if you're going to do that? I guess, I guess he's felt like he has enough film. He's coming off of a great game against AM, and and maybe that's the the, the – the decision, the decision making factor right there for him. And if that's the case, then fine. Look, he's, he's going to be a great receiver. He's going to be a great receiver in the NFL. I have no doubt about it. Um, so if he doesn't want to play and in, in what to him and LSU is probably somewhat of a meaningless game, I, I get it. It's just, it, it doesn't look, it's not the best look for him at, at least uh, when, when you're looking at, you know, kind of ducking competition. I mean, I guess he, he opened that door for himself to be criticized for it. Trey, uh, when's it okay to quit something? You know, I, I don't think it's ever okay to quit something. I feel like that's a loaded question, Mick. I don't, uh, you know, but this is a, a different situation this year. I don't necessarily agree with the players that have opted out or the ones that are, you know, deciding to opt out. But I understand it. This is this is a really weird year. You don't want to do something to mess up your draft stock, especially when your team is is about as bad as it can get at this point. Um, and you know, this is a rivalry game. It would definitely be a personal loss if he had to suffer. And maybe he just didn't want to have to go through that at the end of the day. You'd hope that's not the case. And like Tony said, he's left the door wide open to, um, you know, those conversations, but it, it's weird timing. I get it though. I, I understand players are doing this left and right now, especially on these teams that aren't winning because they just don't want to be a part of it. This year is, is not right. And I think Marshall realized that this week. All right, guys, as we kind of wind down the show, let's go over our college football playoff uh, top four right now. Uh, And I think this is going to be relatively easy, but Kyle, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, when I look at the college football playoff rankings, I I think that, um, I mean, it's pretty easy. I'm I'm trying to find, I think this was um, the last rankings that we had, right, Um, from last Tuesday. And and again, we'll have the show on uh, tomorrow night at six when the new uh, rankings do come out. Um, I, I would probably have it like this, you know, probably Alabama, 
um, Notre Dame, Clemson, and um, Ohio State. Now, in my opinion, I feel that Clemson is the better team than Notre Dame. Um, so, you know, in all honesty, I'd probably go Clemson, but because Notre Dame did beat them head to head. But but the kind of weighing factor is they beat them without Trevor Lawrence, right? I mean, if a team was to beat um, Alabama without Mac Jones, I mean, you could theoretically say the same thing. Who's really the better team? Um, but but I think those are the top four teams. Texas A and M, of course, are going to be ahead of Florida just because of the head to head matchup. And then those the you know seven, eight, nine, and ten those teams can just you know fall off into the sea because nobody really cares about them. Um, but overall, I, I think the top four, um, top five is is a good field, and we'll see what Florida can do here at the backstretch. But I, I, I'm so focused in on that Notre Dame and Clemson game because I think we're really going to see what type of team um, Clemson is, and, and most importantly, what type of team Notre Dame is all right Trey what about you yeah you know I I want to be that guy right now that's that's giving you the oh man Cincinnati's the fourth best team in the country <laughs> or you know one of these other schools should slip in but I can't um you know we had the discussion earlier should Ohio State get in or not maybe you know maybe at the end of the season this conversation is different but for the sake of simplicity right now these are the four best teams in the country Alabama is far and away the best team Notre Dame and Clemson are you know, mirroring each other right now. And Ohio State, while they haven't played a lot of games, they've done enough to show you that they are one of the best four teams in the country. A&M's right there. I think A&M could sneak in as, you know, talent-wise. I don't think they are, but I think they're going to have a chance to make this playoff just because of Ohio State. But at the end of the day, it's simple right now. It's easy. One, two, three, four. Uh, and Alabama's at top. That's always a fun one. All right, Tony. So I, I would have it, uh, my four right now is exactly how it, it looks right now. I, I'd keep that same four. It's going to be really interesting, though, because think about it from a couple of standpoints. Putting Clemson above Ohio State uh, at the moment creates a weird thing because let's say Ohio State barely plays enough game. We, we, you put them at number four, right? Well, what happens if Clemson beats Notre Dame in the ACC title game? Are you going to turn around and play them again in the first semifinal game? It's not a really great, I guess, option for the college football playoffs. I don't think they want to have that back-to-back matchup, but um, that's something that I guess they would have to do if that was the case. Um, look, I, I see those top five teams or Florida, Florida beats Alabama as your, as your true contenders. I think the only way Cincinnati gets into this mix is if chaos happens, um, you know, and maybe A&M loses a game, Ohio State doesn't play enough games, and then maybe they just have to take Cincinnati because there's just no one left. Uh, but I, I kind of see it being Alabama, uh, Clemson, Notre Dame, and and, and Ohio State in, in some order. Maybe they move up Ohio State to three so they don't have to play Notre Dame and Clemson over again, but that's, that's just how I see it. Well, look, I mean, Alabama can't go anywhere. I mean, they belong to number one. And Notre Dame, they, they beat North Carolina. They, they went on the road and won. That was a you know tough game. They took care of business. I'm not saying that UNC is a physical football team, but, you know, Notre Dame did what they had to do. I like Clemson at number three. I like Ohio State at number seven. No, actually, number six. I, I think Texas A&M deserves, deserves number four because, because look, I mean, I, I like. I think Ohio State will make the college football playoff, but they've only played four games, you know, and and they're they're awful lot. And I don't know. I mean, I'd slot, I'd just slot them back. I'd put Texas A&M and Florida, and then Ohio State. And knowing that Ohio State had a path to get to the national championship game, but that they, they have to play themselves in. I mean, we're giving them a lot of credit. They haven't played that much football yet, you know. And we can say what we want to say about Texas A&M. They did beat Florida, and that's a big win. And they only lost to Alabama, and that's the number one team in the country. So. Um, you know, it, it. I think that early in the season when teams haven't played that much, you reward the teams that have played, and it is a weird year. Uh, but, you know, I, I look at it like that. And, Sam, we really appreciate the super chat. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you what. Looking at LSU right now, um, it, this could be one of the worst seasons for defending national champ uh, that we've, we've seen. And it may be that way for a long time. I mean, I, I, it – it's it's like I said, it's a, a sinking ship. All right, guys, the last thing we're going to talk about before we get off here is odds of who is who has the odds of of getting to the uh, college football playoff in the national championship game. And um, right there it is, Alabama, uh, according to Vegas, 
um, 40% chance of getting to the title game. I was asked uh, mm-hmm. today who I thought was going to be in the title game. I think it's Alabama Clemson again. Feels like Alabama Clemson again. Looks like Alabama Clemson again. I think they're the two best teams by far, except I think there's a gap between Alabama and Clemson, but I still think Clemson could beat Alabama. I don't think that oh, there's a guarantee that Ohio State's even going to get into the college football playoff. What do you think, Kyle? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm with you. I think it's going to be Alabama and Clemson, um, and, and we'll we'll see what happens. I, I think they're, those two are on a collision course, and I'm with you. I don't think Ohio State's going to even finish out the season or at least qualify for the college football playoff, so we'll just ha- kind of ha- wait and see to um, what happens with them. I was surprised when I was looking up the, st- the stats tonight, um, or the odds, rather, that Vegas Insider still has Ohio State with a 28.5 probability chance to reach the uh, national title game. I think Alabama clearly – um, the front runner, but they, you know, they they have to continue to run the table. They have to beat Florida. We'll see if they can outshoot the Gators, and we'll see where they line up in um, the College Football Playoffs and who whoever they play. I mean, it'll be the one versus four, most likely in the Sugar Bowl. This team's loaded on both sides of the ball. If the defense continues to play the way that they're playing, you know, they're they're going to be able to to you know control whoever they play against, and that includes a team like Clemson, who has a lot of firepower. Um, that's really the only team that, when I look at the giant spectrum, that I think could challenge Alabama. But overall, right now, according to Vegas Insider, um, Alabama with a 40% chance to reach that title game. Tony, it feels good to be an Alabama fan right now. It, yeah, it, it must. I mean, because it's the, the number one team. And they're, they're, Alabama's the number one overall, you know, just I, I don't think anyone comes close to Alabama right now in terms of just where they're at. Um, even when you look at Notre Dame, I, I don't think that you can, you know, Alabama's wins over ranked opponents is it is really speaks for itself. Um I think when you're looking at it, I think that 40% should probably be a little bit higher. I can't, I'd be really shocked if Alabama doesn't make it to the national title game. So I, to me, I put that, you know, that, that title game's on probably like, like 55, 60%. Trey? Yeah, you know, I mean, 40% is a high number, but I think it, it could even be higher. And I think if Ohio State doesn't make the playoff, you know, if they're kept out because of scheduling reasons, whatever else, I think that number skyrockets because there really isn't much competition at the top this year when you think about it I think like you said Clemson is is the team um, if there is a team that could beat Alabama this year but I don't think Notre Dame's really even in the same ballpark at this point um, you know and, and if you think about it too there's I think when you talk about the playoff the matchup would just be so favorable for Alabama um, site-wise they're probably going to get a pick where they want to play um, and, and, you know, that number four seed could end up being a Texas A&M or a Cincinnati or B. So, you know, there's a chance that that first game is significantly easier than it has been in years past, which really sets up Alabama for the national title. Um, you know, but at this point, I think the sky's the limit for Alabama. They have the highest ceiling um, and, and there's really not much to get in the way. If you think about it, the one game people look back on and, and try to point out flaws is that old Miss game. But Alabama scored 63 points in that game. They won by two touchdowns plus. So, you know, even when you talk about the flaws, they've been so, so minute. Um, it's hard to think about Alabama losing a game this year. Oh, guys, look, I'm a crowd pleaser and. I, I got this message on here. It's a chat. I love all of your guys' chats, super chats, and being part of the show. And Jonathan says, how many times do you watch that locker room video a day? Well, look, Jonathan, and everyone watching, if you guys give me in, in this show – Thumbs up right now, and you subscribe to the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Before we get off here, I'll, let, I'll, bring, I'll bring Ed out one more time and let him be Ed. Ed be Ed. But what I want to tell you guys before we do that, and I'm going to give you a chance to, to give us the thumbs up, subscribe to our channel before I bring Ed out again and see if we can do this, is to remind you that we got a jam-packed day tomorrow. It includes uh, Tony, uh, Tony's got a bunch of stuff coming out. Uh, and you can follow him on Twitter and on the BamaInsider.com uh, website. He's going to be following all the stuff that's going on. Andrew Bone has some stuff to talk about. Him and Kyle will get together tomorrow night at 7 o'clock to go over recruiting, and uh, Kyle and I will be on tomorrow at 6 to check out the college football playoff rankings and where Alabama and the rest of the field is. So with that said, guys, we appreciate you. And one more time, I'm going to hit this button just to let all you guys enjoy this one more time. Everybody, hey, we've been waiting for this moment, man. Let's go right here in the middle of the damn field. Let's bring it down, take it on three. Hell yeah! Because this is our house from now on. Yes, 
sir. Take it on three. One, two, three. Five. All right, if that doesn't get you ready, I don't know what would. <laughs> so for Kyle and Trey and Tony, I'm Mick. Thanking all you guys for watching Monday Night Quarterback. Six o'clock on Monday, we'll be back to break it down right here on the Bama Insider YouTube channel. Thumbs up. Subscribe and don't forget $75 right now. The deal of the year, it's the holiday deal. You get 75 bucks. You get you you pay that. You get an entire year's membership. Uh, you also get a $75 Nike gift card. The promo code is Nike75. So uh, so check us out. And and Andrew Bones got a bunch of stuff going on. Recruiting's really heating up, and you got signing day coming. So it's going to be uh, pretty hot. All right, guys, thanks for watching.